uh, this year we have an innovation because instead of doing just a traditional uh, question and answer session, we're going to do the questions and the discussion also with a panel. So, um, Janine, you're already in place for the panel, but I'd also like to invite um, uh, John Manville from Cisco and uh, John Rennell uh, from, um, uh, from Fujitsu and my colleague, um, George Pavlou, who is going to be, shall I call you chair or moderator? Um, and uh, so, so welcome all. Please make yourself comfortable. You have microphones, um, but uh, supplementaries are possible. Either use one of those or the yeah, I'll, I'll probably use that whichever time. is best. So having having got all this set up, I think our chair has two or three slides which he's going to chip in, so he's going to get in first, is rather cunning of him. Um, and there they are indeed. Uh, so now I'll hand it all your responsibility, I, 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 George. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alwin. Thank you. Uh, I would like to welcome the panelists. I'll introduce you in a moment, guys. Um, uh, right, so I mean, let us start with that. Actually, Janine was introduced, and we know we heard a very interesting presentation. We've got John Reynolds from Fuzetu. Would you like to say a few words about yourself, John? And uh... Thanks very much indeed. So yes, I'm John Reynolds. I'm a dairy farmer's son from Carlisle. I'm a CTO for Fujitsu for UK and Ireland. Uh, and we do everything from air conditioning, uh, largest in Asia, to subsea cable, 90,000 kilometers thereof, uh, and uh, rather a lot besides. Then the only thing we don't make pretty much is cameras. Uh, but indeed, it's a lovely, wonderful ecosystem. Uh, and indeed, Cisco, therefore, is one of our partners, as is Flectronics, in a wonderful um, symbiotic relationship, uh, which I think is part of the future. So uh, I haven't been to university for a long time. Looking forward to seeing lots of innovative things and making lots of new network connections. Excellent. Thank you. John Malibla can introduce him himself. Some of you may remember him. He has given this lecture before. Uh, he's our liaison to Cisco. He accepts, uh, they accept there our undergraduates for internships and so on. Do you want to say a few more words about yourself, John? Sure, thanks. Thanks, George. Uh, yes, so my name is John Manville. I, uh, I'm SVP in, in Cisco, where I'm responsible for the infrastructure in Cisco's IT team. What that really means is running the IT department, but also being a beta test or beta tester for a lot of the Cisco technology that comes out, which can be really exciting. And we have a lot of robust discussions with our, with our BUs, so thank you. Okay, so before we, I'll sort of set a little bit the scene about some of the issues following to what Janine said with a few slides just to um, see basically what, um, uh, what's going on in this area. So we have seen the, the panelists, I'm the coordinator, myself. So about the Internet of Things, a, a little bit of an introduction in addition to the things that Janine said. Uh, according to, to Cisco in particular, um, they expect to see some, some 50 billion devices connect to the global Internet infrastructure by year 2020. Uh, we're talking of uh, a massive scale of unprecedented level, which we don't have today. And uh, the, those sort of objects, let's call them, some of them very small resource constraints, some of them bigger, of course, mobile, whatever, uh, they will interact with each other, but they should also be accessible from central applications uh, across domain and administration boundaries. And this poses uh, a big issue here. I'll sort of bring it on the table. So some of the issues that people talk about in the Internet of Things are um, intermittent connectivity, mobility of all those devices, uh, resource constraints, security, privacy. We'll see some other issues. Now, potential applications. We heard about uh, uh, smart healthcare from Janine quite a lot, but we have applications such as uh, smart homes with uh, um, systems that monitor from temperature to humidity to the contents of the fridge and send an alert to the owner to sort of buy some milk on their way home this evening or whatever. 
and uh, much more important, of course, smart transportation. This I can see some serious applications there. Uh, before starting a journey, one should be able to see in real time the congestion from basically signals uh, transmitted from all the vehicles that take a particular route. Uh, then the vehicle that the owner drives basically should also get into that, coordinate, cooperate possibly with other vehicles along the route uh, when you're not at home and don't have access to some uh, application running a data center or whatever. You can have ad hoc communication with other vehicles to see what kind of congestion there is further down the road and so on. So these are some of the applications. There are so many others actually that we'll see in the years to come. Uh, looking now at the, the principles behind uh, the Internet of Things and this technology, this emerging technology, uh, the, some similar principles have, we have seen before in technologies like uh, mobile ad hoc networks, MANETs, which require different routing protocols and so on, sensor networks that introduced uh, resource constraint kind of operation and so on, even delay tolerant networks where we have uh, intermittent connectivity and you have to get messages uh, in some uh, adverse conditions and so on. Uh, but on the other hand, the Internet of Things uh, takes all these things one step further and uh, this keeps us researchers in, in job. Uh, new protocols and approaches are required for that. So seeing some of the key issues, and I'll leave it to that to ask the panelists a few things. Uh, of course, we have already solutions right now. I mean, you have the companies here working on the technology, but uh, some of these solutions are proprietary, silo-based, as I would call them. They, for example, an Internet of Things solution from Flextronics would not uh, possibly cooperate and work with an Internet solution thing, Internet solution thing from, from, from Fujitsu or whatever. Uh, if we were to standardize things and make things open, we need somehow to, to get uh, standardized solutions for all of those devices, uh, and then the concept of the, the issue of scale comes into play. So we need to have naming and addressing for 50 odd billion devices. Can we do it? Uh, is IPv6 a solution there? Um, we need, I mean, this leads to an issue of scalability. We need the centralized name resolution of massive scale that we have not done until today. Now, coming to resource constraints, is, uh, is processing advancing well enough to take care of the processing required for the applications and visits in the 10, 20 years in the future? Is, uh, is battery power adequate? Will it going to be adequate? Uh, is bandwidth enough with all this multitude of devices transmitting from here and there and getting the global internet ecosystem a, a massive, big sensor-oriented network and actuator-oriented network if you want? Will we need lightweight protocols? Of course we will. There's no way we can run uh, TCP and IP. IP we can possibly run a small version, but no protocols like TCP, which are fairly heavyweight in small devices. Then intelligence. Can we uh, sort of have enough capabilities in those small devices to do reasoning, to do data aggregation, and, and do it without uh, uh, impairing the battery life of those devices. What about self-organization? In the example I, I brought that uh, cars running on the highway could possibly talk to each other and uh, uh, decide where's congestion further down the road and all that. Then we, we want reliability for critical applications. We heard about this healthcare application for Janine for diabetes and sort of uh, possibly remote sort of uh, manipulation of injections, so on. For that, you want really reliability. You want to have it 100%. Of course, security and privacy is another very big issue in this area. And last but not least, we want to have both ad hoc mode of operation where these devices talk to each other and also infrastructure-based mode of operation where they report to centralized uh, through sort of access to the global internet to some central application that controls them and gives directives what we want to do. Now, so these are so, some of the issues and uh, I want to get the panelists' opinion of if this would be possible to have a global internet of things based on standard protocols in 10, 15 years from now. And the last question is, which will be the key enabling technologies? Of course, uh, the internet is based on um, IP and IETF-based protocols, but uh, the traditional telecom operators are working on those, that 5G kind of solution of the evolution of cellular networks, uh, and they have seen there an opportunity to grab some of the market. So will they have some way to say in the internet of things, or it will all be IETF-based and driven from that direction? So starting with that, I've got a lot of questions here. I will open the, the floor to people here. So let's start with, with let's take the, start the other way around, start with John Manville now. I'm 
you want to give us your views on any of these things here, John? Sure. <laughs> sure. How about this? Uh, so I think I, I think the, the there's two main main issues um, with the internet of things. It's going to be here, as, as we've heard about. It's it's going to be here. Absolutely, it's going to be a, an integral part of our lives. Security, I think, is a is a key aspect of this. I think not just from a privacy point of view. And by the way. There's a really smart guy in the U.S. called Peter Diamandis. I'm not sure if you've heard of him, but he, he feels as though with the advent of smart cars, uh, uh, self-driving cars, uh, that um, use radar and various other things to, to identify where they're going to go and, and, and drive themselves, everybody is going to be uh, able to be uh, identified in the street, whatever they're doing. And so he believes in the future we have to get used to a world which is... Uh, free of privacy. Um, whether that's going to happen or not, I'm not sure, but I think that in, in conjunction with big data, I think that is going to be a real issue. But there's also the, the issue of, um, of denial of service attacks and various other things like that. I think that is going to be a really big issue because these, all, all these sensors, uh, it's going to be very hard to update the firmware in them if you, if you can at all. And so that's going to be one, one major area which I think is a lot of really interesting work in there. Another area is about this bandwidth constraint issue. I think personally, and I think, I think Cisco feels this way as well, that uh, we are going to have to do a lot of the pre-processing at the edge of the network. In fact, one of the posters today was, was trying to do some of that, I think. I thought that was, that, that was pretty interesting. So I think those, those two things, uh, processing at the edge and only sending back the, the important information and the whole, whole aspect of security, I think those are two of the main issues that, w that we've got to deal with, and in interesting issues that we've got to deal with. Th th thanks very much, John. Thanks. Uh, the other John now. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and building on what John's just been talking about, to be honest. Um, so uh, we coin uh, this the sort of human-centric intelligent society, uh, and therefore it's getting back to then what Jean was talking about in terms of making it seamless and enriching lives in a completely ubiquitous way, and yet not even noticing it's there. Uh, and in that sense, um, we're really talking about the fact that this year we'll be launching then silicon photonics based um, infrastructure and ingestible tech that's already passed UK and US med medical regulations, uh, partnering with the ecosystem which is making it possible. Therefore, you, you, you pop the tablet in your mouth uh, and it goes wherever it goes and it's tracked on your arm uh, and uh, providing valuable data in real time therein. Um, now, the, th the points we're then talking about, I think, we're really saying is that. Yes, 6 Lopan um, and 5G, which we're working on, uh, will end up being ubiquitous and we'll have, we'll have bits of moments where we'll have Betamax versus uh, all the other varieties of VHS in those various uh, different um, styles. Um, but if you think about 50 billion devices, then actually that's a big number, but it's not really that big. Actually, the number of connections in that mesh is the big number. In the self-forming autonomous, autonomous mesh, that's really the key massive number we're talking about. And I think whilst we bought a company, Globe Ranger, last year doing edge network connectivity, um, then that's one of those things I do agree with. But equally, the thing that makes me nervous is what you end up filtering out. Because arguably, when you come up with the algorithm, that then you preempt what the important aspect is, you've actually already pre-filtered, if you're not careful, all that insight you've otherwise missed, is otherwise got to be mashable. Because guess what, storage, I mean, kind of ignore that as a cost. Yes, of course, we sell great storage, uh, but ignoring that as a relative cost, because it, it's price per, pace per petabyte is going down all the time. Actually, it's the point is you don't really know the value of the information until you see things and trends over time. So taking and polling intervals is one of the things I've been talking about and seeing today. For 15 minutes, it's not enough. When we're then talking about, be it a tornado or an earthquake hitting, you need to know the tremble before it happens to preempt to make it truly seamless and all of that I think is getting to the point of security I think trust you can do a whole lectures and stuff on trust of course, yeah. I think trust is the efficacy effectively of what you're connecting to with 50 billion things connected to things how do you actually know it's safe to connect to and things that aren't actually being sniffed in the process or being manipulated because things emanating data is one thing actually with control planes when you then get a six low band control plane where you can actually control everything that is effectively end of day software defined. With software defined everything and everything controlled by a control plane, then arguably therefore a fire sale in some films is eminently possible. 
and it's the trust of that which will therefore provide the prim net premium that you play which all society is effectively based on. So a human-centric intelligent society is based on true tenets of real trust, which is proper human nature, not just technology. And we're at point zero almost with RFIDs having no, even no security at all for the time being. And we're talking about trust and sort of, you know, much, much more stronger security further down the road. Just before I go to Janine, what do you think about the thing that John said? I mean, should uh, most of the computation be, in, be done at the edge rather than sort of in that sort of mesh of small devices? Do you think that those small devices, in, as time goes by, will have enough processing power to do some of the computation in there? Yes. <laughs> Let me about, get the Chinese so in there. Okay. Yeah, we, no, we talked about. Um, I do think. I mean, I think one. I think it's going to be necessary because necessary because of the complexity um, of the amount of information. So I, I would agree that while there will still be master-slave systems, um, and some of that may be part of the way separate topic, but part of the way we deal in the near to midterm with some of the security issues is not that we have necessarily different protocols, but we create closed systems sort of in absence of us knowing how to create a secure open system or along the way of creating an open secure system, which I think we will do, but it will take time. But to the point about wearable computing and, and portable computing, I mean, the ability not only for us to uh, do um, compute in very small capabilities and whether you're looking at new systems that a Qualcomm or a platform like the Curie platform that Intel has, we will have the option to have very sophisticated, localized compute capability at the sensor if we so desire. There's a trade-off between price performance and, as I said, network protocol, but the capability exists now and will exist in very small, smaller than buttons and pinhead capability essentially. So I think the capability is there. I think the bigger question is also battery and compute. The battery, the battery capability. And so I'm in a room with computer scientists and EEs and while I've spent my career in that space, I'm a chemi material scientist and I think the biggest challenge in battery is the fact that we have so many new material systems and like it or not, it takes 20 to 30 years to really mature and make a, material, a new material system robust. The good news in, in, in battery storage, at least from what we're seeing, both on the, the small scale as well as the mid to large scale, which is necessary for automotive or for things like energy and the smart grid, is new systems, not only advanced lithium ion, but sodium hydroxide, zinc systems, zinc air, vanadium systems, have had almost to their 20 year run. So I think within the next 10 years, we will have more choices in battery. But for those of you who are working on energy harvesting, uh, capabilities or other types of battery. I think of all the technologies I showed, sort of the one that's lagging, it being ready for prime time is battery storage to have the right price point for you know the price performance. So if we could speed that one up a little bit. Um, I actually don't think the, the compute will be as much of the issue. Um, I think we may choose to filter it for the networking reason. Um, but the big issue, I think, is going to be the storage. You know, where do we want to pay for the price of storage? Thank you very much. And, and what about bandwidth? I mean, okay, we can filter out some, can aggregate some stuff, filter out, but yeah, bandwidth, I, will it be I, enough? I think, I think that's a question also of the security issue and the protocol issue. I mean, I think, and, and Cisco will help make sure we have a network, with the advent of new capabilities and really where optical is taking us in practical, even if we really need it, we'll have the, the infrastructure. The question will be the protocol and how we choose to connect them. But it won't be the actual piping, so to speak, I don't think. But John may have a different view. Um, I think Cisco is very happy to see as much data as possible <laughs> going, going over the world's networks. Uh, <laughs> However, I think, I think yes, in, in the backbone and up to maybe all, all of our homes and everything is going to be okay. I think, I think there are going to be sort of last maybe, you know, 10 feet or something or three meters is going to be possibly restricted, which is, and there are some even now, that there are some locations in the world where bandwidth is, is, is going to be restricted for the foreseeable future. So I still think that um, compute at, at the edge is, is going to play a part in this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, something, something related to that, I mean, coming to healthcare applications, uh, would you trust uh, sort of, uh, you know, such a system to sort of guarantee sort of reaction to somebody's condition and sort of uh, doing the right injection through an actuator, uh, 
I mean, with all the interference, all the other sort of issues that uh, will be in a networked environment. I mean, there you are. <laughs> I mean, I, I think, to be honest, that um, uh, every day uh, we trust not to crash with uh, traffic lights that uh, tell us when we can stop and go, and we trust that red means stop and somebody else is on green and green means go because somebody else is on red. Um, all of those are basically software generated, right? So all the things around us are predominantly in effect, be them firmware or otherwise, is still software. So right now we already trust the stuff. Critical last infrastructure for the UK and most societies uh, in the modern world are all running on elements of layers of stratas of different historic software. Bits of it written by me, bits of it written by my colleagues and bits of it written by my other people on the table, I'm sure. Um, and, uh, and some of that will persist and some of it hopefully will uh, be replaced by more intelligent stuff. Um, I think as things move further up the abstracted stack, then I think that's where we then end up uh, using and reusing elements uh, of uh, interconnected ecosystem uh, of components which we probably weren't aware of. Um, and indeed, some of the vulnerabilities that we've been noticed recently, we in OpenSSL, et cetera, I think are classics in that instance, that have been, those vulnerabilities have been around for a couple of decades. Nobody was aware of them, uh, and yet they've been massively pervasive in most elements of embedded hardware. Um, and so I am positive that there are many of the vulnerabilities that are out there, some of which people are aware and choosing not to uh, make them known, uh, and some of them uh, are not yet been made aware. But as we continually rely more and more on software, then inexorably, then our attack vectors um, uh, grow inexorably. Um, and that, I think, does provide an element uh, of a risk to society which we haven't yet properly seen. Any other comments on that? Uh, just, just before we open the floor, a, a last thing. What about 5G and the Internet of Things? Your, your, your opinion on that, and then we'll open the floor to questions. <laughs> We're working on I, it. For I know John like <laughs> Let's the others. <laughs> just, just a very quick, quick comment. So, has anybody seen the Italian job? <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice answer. Exactly. <laughs> nice comment. Are you all thinking the same? Yeah, I was going to say it's 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 underway. I don't think we need it for the Intel, you know, for the IoT world, but it will as it comes online, it will enhance our capability. Okay. All right. In terms of 5G, yes, we kind of got um, and I forget exactly which university it is, but our labs in Hayes, um, which is some XBT guys and a couple of alumni here, I think, uh, are still working on we got some 3G patents and we we're working on some 5G patents which um, I truly passionately believe that uh, software-defined networking uh, fused with 5G will create that ubiquitous um, uh, connectivity, um, I'm not going to use IP, but the con uh, continuous connectivity that will bridge the rather siloed personal area, wide area, home area, wide area of our NPLS networks which currently persist uh, and 5G I think will be a great uh, ability to, uh, to make that more ubiquitous and, and streamlined. So maybe I, I could just make a more, more serious answer to your question. Sorry. <laughs> uh, was, uh, I think, I, I think, and uh, again, I think, I think Cisco is doing some some research in this area as well. Um, maybe with some people at, at UCL. I think because of these security issues, some of the things that we've spoken about. I think, I think the network itself is going to have to understand when either it's under attack or some of the devices are under attack. And I think as as you know, I'm not doing a commercial for Cisco, but as it could be anybody else's equipment. But when, when the, the network does touch all these devices, and so if that's the place where, where you're gonna get the most data about what's happening on the network uh, and what's happening to these devices, I think it's gonna be up to the network itself to learn what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. And although it is difficult, I think, I think the network is gonna have to learn how to defend itself and change various security policies on the network when it recognizes that either devices or itself are under attack. Okay, I think it's time to open the floor to questions from, from the floor. Okay. Yes, yourself. Uh, this is uh, Takashi Matsuda, uh, XUCL, and uh, now working with the uh, Kyoto University. Uh, it's a question to uh, Janine. And uh, this is the e engineering department. The, what the, uh, you told a little bit about the healthcare. And the uh, question is the, uh, for you, I think the, I believe the UK is very strong in, in the uh, medicine or healthcare. 
Uh, but in the case of a drug or medicine, it takes a very, very long time from a, a, a phase one to three year translational research. But in the case of the medical device or wearable device, the, uh, could you suggest me the, uh, what is the uh, sequence for the uh, translational research in order to get the approval from the government? If I understand, what's the time frame for time frame under the uh, a uh, step to get a the uh, a device? governmental approval in the U.S. and the U.K. Okay. It, you mean just medical or in consumer as well? So, yeah. So I think um, so. Typically, we're seeing from depending upon how much of its. Uh, new capabilities or not new capabilities, even an accelerated path, it's probably a, a three to four year process for a fully class two and be you know regulated device, uh, medical device. Having said that, many of the wearable capabilities, um, I think in many of the companies, which is also probably a helpful hint if you think you're in this space, if you can make it not be class two, um, then you're in the uh, you know six to eighteen month time period to be able to bring things uh, into certain areas if you've got some track record for the capability and the data for you to be able to fast track through a uh, class one device. So I don't know if that helped. Uh, how to get the mic to you now? Sorry, Andy, can you help, please? Uh, hello, Jonathan Paget. Um, I can't help but make the observation that uh, you are all from very, very big companies. And my question really relates to whether the industry structure is right, in your opinion, to be able to rise to the challenges which you've so well articulated. And it's driven by an observation that in the pharmaceutical industries in the last decade or so, Faced with declining productivity in very early stage research, there's been a seismic shift towards reliance on small independent biotech companies to do the early stage innovation. And then typically IP or asset sales uh, at you know, late or early preclinical phases into the pharmaceutical companies to properly develop. Do you see that sort of evolution happening in the electronics industry? Should it happen? So a, a couple of comments. So um, yes, I think um, we happen to represent. I've, I've run three of my own startups in my lifetime and also been a venture capitalist, so sat on different parts of the table. The innovation that's coming forward, um, I think in large part is coming from startups and small companies, uh, whether they get housed or acquired into the larger companies or, as you mentioned, um, they are actually incubated from like a Cisco Ventures or, or other types of initiatives that are happening. Um, and I, there are companies, pharmaceuticals, some med devices as well that you actually use as a strategy because they have such, such rigorous processes which they need to have in order to be able to, sus to sustain. It is their stated strategy to fund and we actually participate with several investors who help initiate and fund medical device startups and new technology companies with an idea that they will then get acquired by either the parent or in that system. Uh, and I think part of that is, is as much about just the entrepreneurship of being able to move fast and move quickly. Um, and I think that we also see it, um, most of the wearable companies that have been formed in the businesses uh, that have been formed that have been successful uh, were startups less than five years ago. So I think a lot of the new innovation is coming from startups, and there are many mechanisms that large companies have um, to be able to both you know, support and uh, create and help support startups. Thank you. Okay. So Can we have the microphone? Mark? I, I, I would say, I think, uh, unless we are assuming that um, innovation inside a large company is not possible, in which case all the smart people who do want to make a difference and have an impact are going to leave those companies. I think it's really important that large companies have a have you know, multi-pronged attack for this. Yes, they, they definitely have to look at acquiring companies. Uh, they have to look at partnering with other ecosystem people. But I think it's really important that they set up um, the environment inside a large company 
through some, through some other mechanism, um, in, internal mechanism, that fosters innovation and takes some of the bureaucracy away from maybe some of the people who really do want to make a difference in those companies to, to develop new products and, and innovate. If large companies don't do that, I don't think uh, just buying other companies is, is a long-term viable way forward. I think just lastly, um, I'm, uh, my extracurricular task is I'm on the, uh, the advisory board for App Dynamics, and that was formed in 2008, and it's now valued at a billion dollars of last year when it have IPOs eventually. Hopefully that will um, do very well indeed. Um, and so I do think there's no time, but now you can't find a better time than now. Um, with having bought two companies in the last two years, um, each of which had 15 or so people, um, they've done remarkably well. Um, and, and, I, and I think even in the UK alone, um, just the UK bit of producers probably spends ooh, over 500 billion uh, on uh, pounds on IT related suppliers, well, not partners, um, that are classed as SMEs, 750 plus SMEs. Um, yes, of course, we spend um, tens of millions with Cisco and with the, um, bilateral relationships with uh, Flectronics somewhere. Um, but actually, it's an, it's an amazing place to be. You can set up a company in no time at all, and arguably, there is more money knocking around than you know what to do with, actually, if you uh, want to start something up. So, um, as long as that persists, and I think the opportunity is ours to make it real. Absolutely. And in fact, I've got this slide here as well, which I hid until now, where I hope really that uh, um, a lot of uh, startups and SMEs will appear here. There is basically, there is uh, money to make and uh, it's not going to be left only to the, to the big uh, companies like those of the panelists here. Okay, so next question from Peter Kirstein, my mentor back at UCLCS and known as the European part of me. The part of the European uh, there are many meanings to the word silo. And almost all the applications you see at the moment are silo to the extent that you have a sensor and an application around it and then something else you build around that. To what extent do you, do, does the panel think the multi-application sensing, the multiple use by multiple stakeholders uh, will grow to save the trouble of having quite so many different sensors. There are limits to how many sensors you can put into a person uh, and into a, even to a home. Uh, making them multi-user creates quite a number of other problems and solutions. I'd like to hear what the panel thinks about this. Well, I think... Um so there's, it's a gray answer. So I think the way we think about it are the, is the platforms. So we think, I think about human machine interface as a platform, and then you put a wrapper around it because the, 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 what I need for sports when I'm skiing down the hill for a, you know, a virtual reality goggle is different than what I need in a BMW factory. I'm using the same underlying core capability, and what we're trying to work on is to get to your point about scalability is as much functionality, have the 80-20 rule apply, and have as much functionality and roadmap ability so you can upgrade it um, and have it apply to all, and then put the wrapper around it, which is both a, for not only a hardware, a firmware leading to a software wrapper as well. I think that somebody once said, uh, you only need uh, about this many computers in the world. That's 10 or thereabouts. Uh, and somebody else uh, once said that um, uh, the, the network is the computer. Um, and I think, um, well, clearly the latter, I think, will prove to be correct. And the former, of course, is wrong. Uh, and, uh, and the same will be true of sensors and interconnectivity thereof. Uh, I do think there's one uh, thing which um, made me think uh, to your question, which is coalition.org, um, which uh, looks at uh, abstracting away sensors from identity and the broking thereof. Um, and that's a not-for-profit organization, etc. coming up with atom, creating atoms of information, standardizing every possible facet of society and actions therein. And therefore, allowing that arbitrage of information, broking information between the identity uh, and the information you emit uh, and the services which are brokered based on that identity. And I think the services like that, I think, will flourish and persist once we create a critical mass around some of that standardization, which I think will become ubiquitous. Um, uh, and uh, those that uh, 
start to em embellish and enrich that interface, I think we'll be able to succeed um, nicely. Um, of course, it may all be VHS wins in the end, but we'll see. Any good time for many more questions. We've got another five, ten minutes. Okay, so start from there. Yeah. Come there. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I very much enjoyed your talk, Janine. Uh, and I had a question around uh, uh, how you're going to actually do this uh, global marketing um, in medical devices. Uh, I had the privilege of going to uh, the Medical Device Center for Electronics in Milan earlier this year, and they've got fantastic translational facilities there, very much focused around getting into CE marking and uh, the uh, European market. Now, that's fantastic. I think that Europe has got uh, tremendous uh, advantages over the FDA uh, for, um, uh, for rapid uh, translation, but uh, uh, how, how, do you, how do you square this regulatory science issue about the divide between the U.S. and the rest of the world? Yeah, it, it's an interesting question. I mean, I uh, was with our medical advisory board last week, um, and I actually challenged them to say that while CE may be more adaptable and in, in trying to work with the system more than FDA, um, there's this big market called China. Uh, and I actually think, and there's also a, a thirst and a demand because of the level of where they're disconnected, not just in Asia, but other parts of the world and emerging markets. I actually think in the medical space that we may see because of their almost open thinking around some things and, and thinking differently, um, and I don't mean irresponsibly, I just mean not as bureaucratic. We were set up at a moment in time and some of the processes that we have, and I'll at least comment on the, F, on the FDA side, were set up at when we didn't envision that the things were even possible. Um, and I actually think we will actually see adoption of some of the IOT, particularly in the medical healthcare, outside of these markets first to lay the track in some cases, and then they'll realize, well, maybe we need to not, not regulate, but think differently about our regulation methods in intelligent devices. Thanks. Neil Kersen, my colleague there. Thank you. Uh, fascinating talk and some very interesting discussion. Um, as you're aware, uh, some, company, some corporations now are almost uh, bigger and more powerful than countries. Um, this uh, technology, which is fantastic, and as scientists, we're all very excited about it, is going to make the biggest corporations even more powerful. How are we as nations um, going to protect ourselves from the influence that you will uh, have, given that unlike a government whose first priority is the benefit of the people, companies, the first bar, uh, priority is always to the shareholders and making money. So um, uh, I'd be interested in your comments on that. We're getting to partly political discussion. Huh? I know. I'm, 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 Cisco's going to handle that one. <laughs> Cisco makes more money than we do. <laughs> Less is more. Cisco, I believe, is a very ethical company. <laughs> and I wouldn't work at Cisco unless I thought it was an ethical company. Um, I think with a new CEO that's going to follow on, I, I can only say I trust Cisco. If you see me leave Cisco, well, <laughs> yeah. Go I'd like to just add two things to that. Um, I think that. Cultures are interesting, and again, there's probably um, there's a whole bunch of doctoral research on just exactly that topic. Um, and Japanese culture is uh, is particularly interesting, uh, not least of which, if you watch Click, um, then they'll end up to going to Tokyo every now and again uh, and see some of the amazing and sometimes strange technologies that are, uh, are actually getting used uh, fairly ubiquitous in that society because of the thirst for uh, innovation uh, beyond um, some cultures would think interesting. Um, so I genuinely think that the, other than the sort of the thirst for innovation and creating innovation therein, I think that the sense of duty in the Japanese culture, uh, giri, and a sort of real sense of duty in looking after elders, etc., is actually really quite tangible. Uh, and I think that whilst the perception, perceived perception therein, is that of course every company is just in it for the shareholder, um, slightly possibly frustrating for some, um, 
in Japanese society and Japanese heritage companies, doing the right thing by society is actually imperative and goes beyond mere profit. So I do think that there is a, a solid doing the right thing and actually means something. A human-centric innovation, innovative society, um, and doing things for society are indeed absolutely the right things to be doing, increasing crop yield. Um, so yes, making money, because of course an organisation has to persist um, as an entity for it to provide for its employees and the society that, belong, that it therefore enriches in the process. So I do think there's an absolutely core nucleus to an organisation. And secondly, I think in Europe and beyond, things like antitrust effectively and other related um, structures will help to try and provide a, at least a check and a balance in that context. Okay, Steve from Extra Communications up there. Okay, yes, uh, so this is a question sort of related to the last one, but perhaps a bit simpler. Um, so it's, it's been said that uh, billions of dollars has been spent marketing foods and drinks which are probably not very good for us, and then even more billions of dollars spent by medical companies developing drugs to try and overcome those things which shouldn't have had in the first place. <laughs> so, so I suppose the question is we have a, a you know, really a, a, a fantastic challenge here. If we can come up with some sort of monitoring system which helps us with our nutrition in the first place, then we could you know, do society an awful lot of, of good. So, um, so Janine, I don't know if electronics have ever looked at anything like this where you can monitor nutrition as opposed to looking at symptoms like, uh, like diabetes, as you mentioned in your talk. Yeah. So I agree with you, and I think actually, the, 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 since I'm a glass is half full kind of person, uh, the way to look at the opportunity uh, in consumer health um, is in fact give, give the consumer, educate and provide more information and allow them to be empowered to take decisions. And I think that there's a real opportunity and particularly in the next generation and with social media and the desire, actually almost the thirst, uh, unlike my generation, to have access to information, share that information, discuss that information. I actually think there's a real opportunity now to pair devices even before you ever get and call it a medical opportunity that can be much more informed. Uh, the capabilities exist to monitor other things other than you know how many steps that you had. That was a selection that a company made. The sensors and actuators and the ability to be able to take measurements and do things actually exist. So those would be the ideas that I'd have you think about creating your companies and your devices or go work with small, medium, or large companies and actually empower the individuals with more information because I think you can actually turn the tide. I don't know that you'll get that coming from a pharma or medical company side, but I, don't, I think that's okay. It's a, it, it, it's a big enough market. I think we can actually change the way we think about ourselves and wellness and health with information and access, and this is part of the world of the intelligence of things. The gentleman over there. Uh, today we heard many times about smart and uh, intelligence. Uh, my question is, do you think that artificial intelligence will become a threat to human beings? I mean, without control of uh, human. I think it's not too early to talk about this problem. Thank you. I, don't, yeah, I, I, I think it's an interesting, I think the element of the comments that, that were just made relative to the responsibility we all have as technologists and you know, what we do with the science applies. I agree with you that uh, we're quickly approaching a world where all the movies, at least that I watched growing up, are coming to life, from the Jetsons through you know any of the um, you know Terminator movies. So um, <laughs> I think that uh, you know all of those devices and things can exist, but I, I think at the heart, uh, you know, I again, I'm the glass is half full. So I actually believe there is human compassion, and in the next wave, when I'm next talking, we talk about the intelligence of things. There's a whole thought around having that information and having it delivered again in that way where we can have empathy and have emotion attached to it. So I think it's it's within the power of the people in this room and your generation to decide what we do with all this information. I agree with that. Well, I do think that a point of singularity is a certainty uh, at some point. Um, and Professor Stephen Ferber of Manchester 
um, is uh, not close to that, but has got um, a massively parallel machine with a million cores, which will do about 1% of the human brain, uh, or about 10 mice. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and that effectively is a kind of now thing. Uh, watching him wire it up, or is actually his doctoral student wire it up, is an interesting um, uh, time-lapse video. Um, so with that, and then with an exascale machine, which um, we will have in production by the Tokyo 2020, game, 2020 Games, uh, and not many people think exascale is possible. It absolutely uh, is uh, and will be the case. Um, so when you then put that massive amount of parallel processing, uh, given our last um, uh, K computer, which of course for its I don't know, one year was top of the bill, um, consumed about 20 megawatts of, uh, of power and there was relatively uh, costly to run, uh, that exascale machine will be substantially less con um, uh, consuming of electricity. So raw compute, Silicon photonics sorting out to the network connectivity, um, massive parallel processing, uh, and some of the existing research is already out there. I think the possibilities are absolutely there. Actually, the point is then making sure we put in robust um, fail safes in place such that when things start to become uh, not self aware, but effectively doing what they, were, they learnt, um, uh, interacting in ways that um, no one envisaged, that's when uh, the, that uh, billion device interconnectivity uh, will start to grow in ways we didn't realise when we put it together in the first place because no one designed it as such. So just, just one comment on that, I, I agree with everything you said here. I think um, I, I've seen a, uh, a statistic that says that by the year 2025, for $1,000, you'll be able to buy the processing power equivalent of, of a human brain. And then by 2035, you'll be able to buy the processing power of, for $1,000 of everybody in the world. So That's scary. if that is really true, then we're going to have to come up with way different ways, I believe, of, of operating in that environment because it's going to be a whole different world. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, Ben Thompson <laughs> over there. One of the really interesting things I think about sort of the Internet of Things and the way it's sort of been driven by sort of open hardware or companies that are making hardware that it's really o easy for you know small groups of people and I think that's good in the way that it hopefully will make it more democratic and and hopefully address some of the concerns about you know big companies like yourselves taking over but I think John made a, a really really interesting point that all of these devices, the real functionality of them comes from the ability to network them and either get the information from them in one place or another. And I think John's point about how we get the network to almost like have a human immune system when the foreign invaders come in. But the interesting struggle there, I think, is, is how are we going to square this kind of very open development environment with a network that has to be able to work like, I'm quite a closed system in lots of ways, yeah? Um, I've got hopefully full control over myself and my immune system to do that. And I think that's going to be a real tough challenge. I don't know what your thoughts on. Can we, you know, with some of the work we're doing at the moment is looking at how we can make networks much more open and easier to manage so that you can kind of get services on demand and stuff like that. But how do you kind of square that with having the safety, reliability, sensing that you think that a network needs to look after itself? Obviously, I'm, I'm not the expert in this area, but I'd say it's going to be it's going to take a lot of research and a lot of smart people to to address that issue. I do I do believe the network is going to have to identify when it's under attack. Uh, I think that's the only way in in the future it'll be able to survive. Actually, um, and are there going to be some false positives? Absolutely. It's very very early early days right now in the technology to understand uh, when it's under attack. And I've seen some of the work going on in, inside Cisco. And, um, and there still are many, many um, false positives. But I think um, machine learning is, is, is really rapidly advancing. And I think that um, I think we'll be able to address that. But I, I understand your issue. I don't have all, all the answers there, but I would say uh, the people who are working on it, at least inside Cisco, and I'm sure many people here are aware of that, and that they'll they'll come up with great innovative ways to address it. Okay, the question there. 
good evening all. Uh, my name is Nero Okwa from Wedge 44. And my question is, a lot of the discussions we've heard concerning the Internet of Things is based on data, collecting data, processing data, and making more informed, data, informed use, informed decisions with this data in real time. But my real focus is what are the additional value adds with regards to improved standard of living, uh, improved cross-cultural understanding, and wealth generation for all? I, th I think we started to talk about the concept of the information and the data coming to you in a seamless or transparent way can help people of different backgrounds and different education levels take care of themselves. Um, I think that the ability for us to change, particularly in emerging markets, we focus a lot on the gadgets that we might have in, in you know, the Western world, but you know, there are still a lot of people that don't have access to clean water, don't have electricity, don't have certain basic um, capabilities that are truly being sort of dislocated uh, and adding new capabilities as a result of distributed power and the ability to actually create a system that allows you to get sanitized and cleaned water that you might not have had in a village. So I, I think from my perspective, the, you know, it depends on which flavor of the world, I, you know, we're fairly global, but when I look at the most um, exciting and not expensive and very accessible things that we can do as a, as a group of, of innovators and technologists, it's about taking what might not be bleeding edge technology that we're working on, but actually putting the pieces together in a packaged way, for example, to make sure that people have access to, you know, basic necessities such as clean water. I think, uh, building on what Janice said, a, one of the things that I suspect you didn't realize that Fujitsu produce uh, is lettuce. Um, uh, and yet it's about three million uh, a year um, it's worth uh, in a fab plant um, in Japan, um, given that uh, we've moved out of some of that business. Um, then uh, fab plants are amazingly controlled environments. Uh, and you might think, well, lettuce is a bit of a random one to start growing and for a bit of a tech company. Um, given uh, maybe somebody was, uh, had a good idea and thought, well, might as well use it. Uh, whatever the case, the actual instance is, is, of course, it goes back to an early point about diabetes. Um, and diabetics need low potassium uh, levels. Uh, and therefore, actually, uh, lettuces are high potassium, and therefore diabetics can't generally uh, have lettuces. So if you can then uh, grow a lettuce with five times less potassium, then indeed everyone can enjoy the stuff. Um, and it's not about biotech, it's just about controlling the environment. And therefore, using a bit of IoT-based sensors, um, working out and creating the, generating the know-how based on you can pretty much grow a lettuce with low potassium, which then stays fresh out of the fridge for over two weeks with the name Fujitsu on it. Now, we don't sell it... Uh, <laughs> you can't buy it in any old supermarket, but arguably it is being bought and being used, and this is the use cases for uh, hospitals in Japan. Now, that's one example, and that's a technology company living its brand of, of creating a human-centric intelligent society, shaping agriculture for the benefit of all. Um, and we're using the same technologies then for helping grow crops in arid areas, which are not suitable for it, but not having to use some of the techniques and technologies that otherwise might not necessarily be easily transferable. And I think just one last point, and going back to an earlier question we had, um, whilst uh, culturally we'll probably never necessarily um, scan what we're about to put in our mouth, um, actually naturally um, when you, uh, you sit and contemplate life uh, and what goes in comes out eventually, um, uh, you will be able to sit on your smart toilet uh, and, uh, and that can of course tell you all the things that you uh, should be doing and shouldn't be doing. Um, and you think that's uh, real? Of course it's real. Go to Tokyo and you'll sit on a nicely heated toilet with a command console which you didn't realise existed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can I just make one, one comment on something you said here? It's, it's not quite as funny as that was great. Um, it's, it's that I think it's in, in the US, I was doing a, another talk at some other place, and between 25 and 20 and 25 percent of the food that's grown gets lost in the supply chain. That's pretty obscene. That's, that's so much food that could go to you know, feeding not just the poor people in the US and in the, in the surrounding area, but but other people, I think absolutely, apart from growing more food, IoT technology is absolutely going to improve that, that supply chain so that we don't waste as much food, 
so we can feed more of the people in the world. Excellent. Okay, I think we've covered a lot of aspects here. Uh, one last aspect is education with respect to IoT, and we've got a question from my colleague, Professor Darwaze. And I have to say that uh, we're also introducing an MSc program on IoT here at UCL for next year. So, is that please tell us more about it and ask about education. Th th thank you very much. As we're in university, I'll ask something about education. But, but before I do that, and not aiming to fly the UCL flag too much, we pioneered things to do with the Internet of Things in two ways. The first one through creating a system with Cisco where our students go and spend a year at Cisco in, in, uh, in California working in these areas. And the second area is through work with ARM where we have not only used ARM devices for, for teaching and for education, but we're also specifically creating uh, what I think is a unique module for our MSc students on the Internet of Things where they'll do both practical and, uh, and theoretical stuff that would range from looking at uh, you know, the higher level to the lowest level and to the transmission device and so on. But my question to the panel after I flew the UCL flag is uh, in, ter in terms, when you, when you come to look for uh, employees, whether they are the younger end of graduates or the, the, the graduates with research degrees as the ones you have seen today, what are you looking for? <laughs> I'll go. Um, so because we have a broad base of um, everything from you know, initial design and concept all the through scalability in our innovation centers and ultimately through manufacturing, our interests actually are pretty broad across both computer science, uh, material science, nanotechnologists, and um, electrical engineers that are either part, you know, and ideally want to be part of that process. You know, part of what we're doing now is taking people from design all the way through the scale up and having them go through the full process cycle and then return back to design. So I think that we're probably on our side less about the deep re research capability and more about the applicability. So I'd say little r, big D, moving quickly to uh, real world would be the things that we'd be looking for. Um. I think it's probably very similar, actually. Um, and we're sort of looking, I think we're recruiting about 100 graduates this last year and moving into this, um, getting a, a degree qualification uh, whilst in job, we're starting that this year, uh, as well as apprentices. Um, and I think partly, yes, of course, given, in the UK alone, given a, you all, we all touch um, Fujitsu, or, um, nine, basically every single day, 99% of the population does then it's needed pretty much in any particular field you could think of. Um, so yes, uh, the things I kind of look for is other than the basics, kind of like you know what you're clever uh, and you know what you're relatively social and you know how to interact, it's a can-do attitude. Yes, understand um, the basics, but actually given a task randomly or otherwise, um, can you, without necessarily having been told how to do it, can you figure it out and just work out how to get it done, work with people, work in a network of people, um, and, um, and actually make life more interesting for everyone concerned, because then we only have one life. So, so from the Cisco perspective, I'd say, yes, being smart, being technically skilled in, in whatever area, EE or, or, uh, or computer science, I think all, all those are obviously the basics. I think the most important thing is, is the leadership capability of the person. If they want to, if they really want to change the world and they're out there trying to do that every day and putting their heart and soul into it, that's the type of people who, who, are, who are going to be able to change the world. However, on the Cisco side, we have to set the environment up, as I was talking a little bit, a little bit before, we, we need to set the environment up so that they are successful at doing that and feel like it's a compelling place to work. So there is some onus on the Cisco side, but mostly it's about, it's about the leadership capabilities of the people who we hire. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, we overran a little bit, but it was, I believe, uh, an interesting panel here. I would like to thank again Janine for an excellent talk and all the panelists, John Rannell, John Manville there for excellent contribution to the panel, and also the audience for a very active and informed participation. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs>